Hi, welcome to Slack. Um, just one last reminder, if anyone hasn't already, uh, if anyone wants to hang around for Peter and hasn't already given Neil their money, um, you should head out to Neil sometime soon. Um, next slide, please. In case you haven't been here before, if you need to get to the loo, it's straight out that door. The women's is just on your right. The men's is past the lift out of your right. Um, this is our wonderful committee. Um, I'm the president, James. Um, Tim, our vice president, is not here tonight because he's organizing Python AU, which is uh, starting tomorrow officially. Um, but they're running a Craig Wilson event right now. Neil is outside taking money. Melissa is back there being my remote control. Bob is just here. Harry's downstairs, and Patrick could have made it this week. Um, as you've probably noticed, free Wi-Fi, feel free to use that. Um, please use it responsibly, don't bleep too much, be great for everybody else. Like the presenter. Yeah, like the presenter. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, Python AU starts tomorrow. Um, they actually sold out the tickets that are still with people coming, which is the capacity of the venue so they shouldn't sell anymore. Um, which is about double what they expected to sell apparently. Um, so if you have Sorry, you missed out. Um, Software Freedom Day is coming up in September. We'd like to do something for it, but we need people to both come up with ideas and volunteer to run something. We haven't had any yet, and time is running out. <laughs> so if you do have ideas, um, send an email to the activities list so you can get other people interested. The Education Expo is tomorrow at Rose Hill Racecourse. Um, if you could volunteer to be there, um, Neil's staff, Patrick, says please be there. Don't suck off. If you haven't volunteered to be there, um, you can send Patrick an email tonight and we can arrange something for you, hopefully. Does anybody else come on around? As you know, we're a volunteer-run organization, and we need lots of volunteers to run meetings when you need to participate on the mailing lists. Um, so if you want Slug to be a great place, please volunteer to help out. Um, I'll be talking in the second half about what I'd like to do in the future with Slug meetings, and my plan is going to need lots more volunteers, so please help out. Um, this slide is bomb. Um, OpenC Friends was originally scheduled for the second half, um, and I changed it at the last minute. Actually, I didn't know that I had changed it, so it's still on in the second half. Um, so in the first half, we have Eric, who we talk about the onion data. Um, in the second half, we'll have Stephen McDonald in here, giving a talk on software and the community. We'll have OpenC Friends in the next room. Um, I believe she does got some beautiful of the new XO device. And and I'll be leading a session on the future of Slug, particularly focusing on what meeting format we should have um, over in this session area. And after that, we'll have Lisa. Any questions? Excellent. And then you over to Eric. He's going to talk about talk. So, is this thing on? It is, okay. I know how to drive that. Okay. I thought I said I knew how to do that. There we go. Hi, my name's Eric. Um, I actually just noticed, realized when I was writing at this, 
this talk that um, although I've spoken at Slug many times in the last decade or so, it's nearly always been on programming topics. In fact, every single time it's been on programming topics. And this one is very much not a programming topic. This is very much a user topic, um, which surprised me somewhat. So I'll start off with the obligatory standard disclaimer. My opinions, I don't speak for anybody else tonight. And a quote from Robert Heinlein. What we're really talking about is ways to get around censorship. Our government, in its lack of wisdom, would like to censor what we can see on the internet. Um, their, their ideas are, are, are just wrong on many levels. They've got this idea about refused classification, and that pulls in things that I think are completely unreasonable. Information about euthanasia, abortion, you know, along with child porn, it's also information about things that people should be allowed to know about. Um, it's information that doesn't kill people. And I actually realised just a week or two ago that there's actually something that they, that is very interesting about this censorship debate that I haven't seen actually mentioned. Senator Conroy wants to impose censorship regimes that work for publications like newspapers, magazines and cinema on the internet. And as far as Conroy and people of his ilk are concerned, the internet is like the newspaper and magazines and books and cinema. I suspect he's never used a web forum, which is not like a cinema. I suspect he's never used an IRC chat room, which is not like a cinema. Um, there's, there's lots of models of use of the internet that he and his censorship regime don't fit well. So I actually think, for, first of all, protesting this censorship idea is a democratic duty and also being prepared to work around it if it actually is imposed on us. Oops, wrong way. The other thing is that we're actually kind of lucky in that we live in a relatively free democracy. Um, there are other places where the people legitimately fear their governments. And Thomas Jefferson had some very interesting things to say about that. We are still in, this, in the second stage there where the government should be fearing the people because the government can be kicked out by the people. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, our options are actually not very good in that it's two bunches of people that are almost exactly the same on this issue. I'll get right that. So, a little bit of outline. I'll tell you about what Tor is, what it, how, does it, how it works, setting it up to use it. Like I said, this has got nothing to do with programming. I'm a bit of a shock for me here. Um, it's all something that is pretty damn easy to work. And I, if this, tube, this video gets uploaded to YouTube, with a bit of luck, somebody with a a, a smallest amount of technical clues should be able to follow this on Linux and get this thing working. Tor is the onion router. It, funnily enough, was actually originally written by the no such agency or national security in the US and then released as open source, which is a little bit of a suspicious um, genesis, but it is now open source. So anybody can look at the code and verify that it actually is, is what it says it is and does what it does. Um, it's funded quite strongly by the Electronic Frontiers Foundation. There are Google Summer of Code sponsorship on this project. And it allows users to circumvent censorship, whether that's here in this country un under the scheme that um, Conroy and others propose or whether it's people in countries like China and Iran. Used correctly, and this is the most important thing, used correctly, it can improve a user's privacy and security on the internet. 
I did mention China and Iran. It's actually very interesting to read these two blog posts. Um, the Tor developers and people who run the top level Tor servers are, are playing a very, very interesting cat and mouse game with the people who run the Great Firewall of China and the whatever they've got in Iran. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about what's going on there. It's very interesting and it's not, the end game has not yet been reached. Basically what Tor is, is a network of encrypted tunnels. Traffic from the user is routed through multiple machines to some endpoint. And the idea being that the user's traffic cannot really be connected with the endpoint traffic um, and vice versa. Um, but very definitely the last point here is we do need to understand how it works to, to understand how much security it provides. So the following three images are shamelessly ripped from the Tor Project's website. Um, electronic, whoops, got to be used to that. Electronic Frontiers up here. Um, it's actually different from Electronic Frontiers Australia. Uh, Electronic Frontiers Foundation is the um, global, US-based but global organization. Electronic Frontiers is the Australian one. Um, both worthy organizations. So what we have here is Alice on her computer here who wants to get to some websites over here. These machines here is uh, machines out on the internet and the ones with the green crosses are Tor nodes. And in order to, Alice has got Tor working on her machine. In order to get to these machines over here via the Tor network, she connects to a Tor directory server. This is unencrypted, assumingly open. I'll, I'll get to some more interesting things about that later. And she receives a directory of all of the Tor nodes and how to get to them. Then, Alice's client decides on a route through the Tor node. So there's encrypted traffic from Alice's machine to the first Tor server. The second, this first Tor server encrypts it. I'm not exactly sure of the exact details, but it is, I suspect it's actually one level of encryption is taken off out around the outside and then re encrypted. So we then get this encrypted tunnel through here and then from the Tor exit node here to the server or service that Alice wanted to connect to. And the important thing is that the green links here are encrypted and the final one may or may not be encrypted. If the, if the protocol that Alice has chosen here is HTTPS, then that final link will be encrypted. And if it's HTTP, it's clear text. That is a very important feature of this, uh, a very important thing to remember about the security of this. At some later time, she wants to, to um, contact a different site. Her Tor node will do it via a different path through the Tor network. Um, and again, there's a last unencrypted link. At the moment, the number of uh, Tor nodes out there on the internet, numbers in the thousands. There's a lot of them. Very, very, imp the problem, and this is very, very important, is that the last link may or may not be encrypted depending on the protocol you're using. For people in countries like Iran and, and China, the, the public directory of Tor servers can easily be blocked by their firewall. And that is actually happening so that they can't reach the directory servers that say, okay, here's where the Tor nodes are for you to connect. The Tor team have come up with an idea of Tor bridges. These are like directory services, but they're not publicly listed. And then lists of these bridges are then distributed via email and other sources. Um, those bridges can still be detected by snooping on 
actual Tor users. They can see that they're connecting to first that machine and then a whole bunch of others that are Tor protocol. Um, then they can get, well, okay, that's probably the, 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 the bridge relay that tells that where they're getting their, their original information on where the nodes are. To a certain extent, this um, running bridges and relays on ports like port 443, which is HTTPS, helps in that it then can't be, Tor traffic can't be distinguished from um, HTTPS traffic. What really needs to happen to, to help the problems in China and Iran is for more, more bridge relays. If there's enough of them, it's just going to be too hard for the Great Firewall to block them all. Question? So the question here is, um, could they distribute them by bit BitTorrent or whatever else? Yes, they can, but the sensors in China can get the same traffic. Um, and, that, and that's basically the problem with the directory servers. You know, they can simply, by making them public, they're on a website, the sensors can go there as well. Um, it's a matter of distributing it with a channel whereby the sensors can't get, get hold of them. Um, it's an interesting problem. I, there's more. The, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation is funding research in this area. Um, unsolved problem, but with a bit of luck they will. And, and simply the fact having, having huge numbers of bridges will make it increasingly difficult for them to filter them all. So that, that's, the, that's the real um, chink in the great in the armour of the Great Firewall of China. There's also some plain old technical limitations. Um, bandwidth <coughs> over a Tor network is simply, maybe not less so much less, but um, connections are slower. We're go doing multiple hops across multiple servers, encrypting and decrypting as we go, um, it's going to be slower. For the security, it might be worth it. That's a judgment call. Um, the other thing is that the Tor exit nodes have restrictions. There are, as far as I know, n zero exit nodes that actually allow the final hop to be a connection to port 25 SMTP because that's an in open invitation to spammers. Um, other exit nodes have limitations that, like they won't connect to IRC networks and so on. Um, some IRC networks actually even block um, the Tor exit nodes. Um, but if you're trying to connect to SMTP over port 25, you're probably not doing the right thing anyway, both from, from a security point of view and from doing the right thing. Um, so a very, very brief intro on how to set up a local Tor server. And probably the most obvious question is, why do I need a local Tor server? And that's because you need to have at least one Tor server that you trust. If you, if you don't have control over the very first one, you can actually be snooped. So if your, your, your first step is to a Tor server that you don't control, you don't know what that, that first Tor server is doing, and they can snoop you. If, you, if you, your first hop is to your own Tor server, you're encrypted from there on and no one can snoop. So the first Tor server in the network gives you that trust. And second and subsequent servers, they can see that there's encrypted traffic, but they can't tell whether it's coming from, whether the previous node was an end user or just another Tor relay. Installing it on Debian, I don't use anything other than Debian and Ubuntu. Um, I haven't tried it on Ubuntu. Um, uh, 
Right. Okay, so the response there was the Ubuntu people have, <coughs> sorry, the Tor people have their own Ubuntu repository for the latest and greatest Tor stuff. I'm running Debian testing and the, the Debian maintainer um, is actually involved in the Tor project and the Debian testing version is right up to date and you know, within a week or two of the latest and greatest. So on, on Debian at least, on Ubuntu, like the gentleman says, uh, you'll need to add a, a Tor repo, but on Debian it's simply an app get install. Tor, the actual server. NTP, there are an, a couple of attacks against Tor in basically getting information that they shouldn't, an attacker could potentially get information that they shouldn't by looking at differences between the time stamps on the machine that they're looking at and the real time. So if you run NTP on your Tor machine, um, your machine should be close enough so that those kinds of attacks aren't possible. And the other thing is Polypo, very worthwhile to install that. It's a small local caching web proxy and you run your web browser, for instance, into Polypo to do the caching, into Tor, into the Tor network, out into the internet. Um, Yes, Privoxy. Um, the general consensus seems to be that Polypo works better than Privoxy. Poly uh, Privoxy was written in Perl, I believe. It doesn't do HTTP streaming. It doesn't do a uh, couple of HTTP. Yeah, it does. So the question is, is Polypo better than Squid? For this application, yes. For a general web proxy, well, sorry, for a web proxy, just looking at it as a, as a web proxy, on a local machine, it may be better than Squid. For a home or an office, I would think not. It's designed to be small and fast and limited. Um, You, yes, you would, if you've got Squid running in your office building, you still want to have Polypo between your web browser and the Tor network because that doesn't go through Squid. Okay, we're done there. Setting up the local Tor server is pretty trivial. On Debian, all I needed to do was add two lines to etc. Tor, Tor RC. Um, Tor basically um, pretends to be a SOX proxy. SOX is an old proxying protocol that I last used sometime around 2000. Um, it's still around, it's useful for, for Tor. Um, so that's basically all I needed to do, the only modifications I needed to make to get it running on my machine. Once you've got the Tor server running, you can actually run any networking client that will talk via a, so a, a SOX proxy. That's FTP, WGET, and SOXify will talk, take just about any existing networking client and run it through a SOX server, which would run it through Tor. That's advanced usage. I'm not going to do anything further with that here tonight. It's part, if you do apt, cache, apt file search Soxify, it is listed in some obscure package. I didn't know what it was, but yes, it is very definitely available. Um, setting up Polypo for the caching web proxy. Um, again, that's the config file. These are the only changes I needed to make. The first one is to tell Polypo that 
it has a parent proxy, and that is a SOX proxy, and it's on local port, local host port 90, uh, 9050. That's the port that um, Tor by default listens to. Did I? Yeah, so we set up Tor here to be listening on port 9050 on localhost, and Polypo will talk to localhost 9050 as its parent box. The second line there, disk cache, is telling it not to cache anything on disk. So it acts as a web proxy, but it does so purely in memory. And finally, disable local interface. Um, Polypo has some administrative features that can be accessed via HTTP, localhost,